people ready to to get into our our chat <laughs> green room cat chat yeah exactly exactly but that has been one of the nice uh i suppose outcomes of zoom and having to have all these meetings of zoom is getting to know colleagues and friends and peers through the other species that they're living with be they plants or cats it's quite nice can diffuse a, a faculty council you see a cat tail like <laughs> bobbing along so just letting everybody know here that we have started we've opened the webinar so people the numbers are rising of our participants joining so I'll just uh, as that's happening I'll just say a couple of words here uh, good afternoon everybody welcome to the panelists and audience members alike as you settle in to the webinar I'll just say a few words on behalf of Force Space we're delighted to work with conversations in contemporary art convener Maya Ray Oppenheimer for the 2020 2021 season uh, of Sika, and we extend a warm welcome to today's guests, Michelle Pearson Clark, Michael Sergil, Ashley Ragubir, and collaborators, Ethnocultural Art Histories Research or EAR, for this third episode in a series devoted to questions of radical hospitality. For space, physically located at Concordia in downtown Montreal, virtually accessible via your computing device, is a university-wide platform focused on working collaboratively with our community of students, of staff, and faculty across disciplines to produce moments of connectivity, of reflection, discussion, work, and process-based exploration. And to that end, we are delighted to host this season of SICA. Before passing things off to Maya, just a few procedural notes. This event is being recorded and it will be available on our website, concordia.ca slash four shortly. Uh, simultaneously, we are live streaming to Facebook. So uh, you can check that out and make comments below the video at CU Fourth Space. We invite those of you attending the webinar to use the chat for any comments that you may have throughout uh, today's conversation. And if you have specific questions that you'd like our moderator to address, please use the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. It's now my pleasure to pass proceedings over to you, Maya. Welcome. Thank you so much, Anna, for that introduction. Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Maya, and I'm the convener of Conversations in Contemporary Art this year. Um, Conversations in Contemporary Art is hosted and supported by the MFA program in the Faculty of Fine Arts at Concordia University, which is in its bricks and mortar campus located in downtown Chiojaga, Montreal. Um, and usually we would be gathering for this series in a lecture theater um, in one of the campus buildings. Uh, but we are currently convening under emergency circumstances during this pandemic scenario. Um, but I want to uh, invite you to let us know where you are joining us from. Uh, whilst we usually have, as I mentioned, this gathering in downtown Chochaga, Montreal, uh, because we are on the Zoom, we can welcome folks from both near and far. Um, the server for Zoom um, is located in Toronto, Tagoronto, which is where one of our panelists is gathering or is joining us from. Um, that's on the traditional territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, um, the Wendat, the Chippewa, and the Haudenosaunee. Um, our other two panelists are joining us in um, Tochaga, Montreal but please let us know where you are zooming in from. Uh, we can all see each other as panelists, but we cannot see you. We can sense you and we will get to know you a bit better through your energies and the, as you put in, in the comments and the questions that you bring to our panelists. Um, so please feel free, as Anna mentioned, to comment and contribute as we go and to let us know where you are zooming in from. Uh, so as I... Um, uh, warm up this Zoom space and uh, prepare to introduce our, our panelists for this afternoon, I'd like to say a few words about Sika. Um, it's been a series uh, that welcomes artists, curators, scholars, writers to talk about practices in various capacities from various perspectives. And this year, um, for the first time, we are pursuing a theme, a theme of radical hospitality. And it is a, a seed that's been growing um, over the summer. These event series usually take several months in the planning. 
Um, and it positions itself um, around this idea of radical hospitality to ask critical questions about what those two words mean in juxtaposition with one another. Um, what does radical mean? What does radical paired with hospitality mean? What are the possibilities or promises or tactics of a platform investigating uh, radicality in terms of significant change, radicality in terms of political progression that is also attached to an institution like a higher so-called higher education institution like Concordia University. So this is the third of our talks that are cantilevered around this idea of radical hospitality. And part of the conditions in which we are trying to extend radical hospitality as a platform to our guests is having a sort of free and open conversation around what these talks look like. Um, so it is my, my pleasure as the SICA convener to work with recommendations and um, hopeful invitations put forward by past and current MFA students, as well as faculty, um, to balance them with my own sort of hopeful invitations. And as we were deciding and moving forward on this radical hospitality theme, um, Michelle Pearson Clark's name came up repeatedly, not only from students' uh, nominations, but also from faculty requests. And I confess selfishly from my own ideation, um, rarely do I teach a course that doesn't in some way, shape or form include, allude to or work with ideas um, that Michelle is also bringing into not only her practice, but also conversations with community and processes of making culture. Um, so this talk is our third in the Sika series, and it will unfold differently than the first two if you were able to join us. Um, in following through with the praxis of how Michelle works with and thinks through radical hospitality, um, she made the suggestion that it would work to, to share the platform, to not do an artist talk per se, but to be in conversation with others who are thinking about radical hospitality. Um, before I get to the introductions, I would like to make a few hospitality notes. Speaking of hospitality, um, this talk, as Anna mentioned, will be recorded and placed on the Forspace YouTube um, and captions will be enabled. Um, for our live session, we weren't able to get in a live captioner, but our future Sika talks will have that accessibility. Um, I'm also in a position to make a transcript of this talk available to you, should you wish one or benefit from having one. So you can simply email me and I will provide you with that. Um, and we can also use the uh, chat as an inclusive space to reflect upon elements that are arising in the talk, but to also um, repeat or validate or uplift things that have been mentioned by the panelists. So we do have that not as a live captioning resource, but as a, a text sort of call and response space. So it is my pleasure to finally um, get on with a few introductions, at which point I will pass the mic to Michelle, who will say a few more words about the flow of the, um, the time that we have together until three o'clock. Um, I have recently learned the, the expression of a multi-hyphenate uh, artist, and I feel as though Michelle Pearson Clark is one such multi-hyphenated um, cultural, cultural worker. Um, born in, um, in Trinidad, Michelle is also a, an artist, a writer, an educator, working across uh, photography, film, video, and installation work. Um, also an educator, um, and she holds a master's in social work from the University of Toronto and has an MFA in documentary media studies from Ryerson University. I would like to point out a few recent accolades that Michelle has received. Um, she was awarded the Toronto Friends of the Visual Arts 2019 Finalist Artist Prize and was a nominee of the 2019 Paul Dohek and Norman Hofford Career Achievement Award. Um, you might also know Michelle not only through her multi-hyphenate artist practice, but also as um, the current Toronto Photo Laureate. Um, I will put the Instagram handle that Michelle is using for that position that um, she's also using to uplift and showcase other photographers. Um, and also is the inaugural 2020-2021 Artist in Residence at the University of Toronto's Bonham Centre for Sexual Diversity Studies. 
Uh, moving in the Zoom screen, um, our next panelist I'd like to introduce is Mikhail Sergil. Um, I have had the pleasure of getting to know Mikhail um, through our workings, um, conversations, explorations um, in the MFA program um, in the Department of Studio Arts. Um, it's always a pleasure to um, hear and hold space for what Mikhail brings to a conversation in class or with your peers at CRITS and in her work. Also a multi-hyphenate cultural worker, um, is an artist, curator, um, works with and through and on texts and books from post-colonial period from the 1950s to the present. Her artistic work um, aims to understand and rewrite history of Black communities and more specifically of women through weaving often perceived as a medium of craftsmanship and categorized as feminine, the artist, being Mikhail, uses the lexicon of weaving to question the relationships of gender and race. And oh, I just love a short bio that also contains an argument. Um, so through Mikhail's uh, presentation of her work and discussion, we'll get to know more about, about her work there. And uh, last but not least, um, Ashley, I'm very happy to introduce Ashley to the assembled audiences. I also have had the pleasure of getting to know Ashley um, through work in um, the Faculty of Fine Arts. I used to be based in the Art History Department, um, but left to migrate over to Studio Arts, and that was when Ashley joined the department. So we were sort of passing entities, but have had the pleasure of getting to know Ashley as a writer, as a scholar, as a deep and thoughtful thinker, and also as a pedagogue um, through some of the teaching work that we also do across departments in the faculty. And um, Ashley is also a Trinidadian Canadian writer, a master's student, uh, which is our current relationship to the art history program at Concordia. She is a co-founding member of the Afro Futures and Research Collective with student and faculty peers at the university. And her writing practice and interdisciplinary research examines Afrofuturisms in contemporary art Black Diaspora Studies, Black Canadian Contemporary Art, and Transatlantic Slavery Studies. Um, what isn't mentioned in um, the write-up that Ashley circulated is that she's also the recent winner of the Canadian Art Writing Prize. Um, so with these wonderful welcomes, um, I'm very happy to hand over uh, the Zoom space to Michelle, who will say um, a few words about the flow and uh, we'll launch our discussion. Thank you very much for starting off, Michelle. Thank you for those uh, very generous introductions, Maya. It's always a little awkward uh, listening to uh, yourself being spoken about, um, but I'm so happy to be here. Obviously, I'm, I'm uh, zooming in from Toronto. I wish I could be there uh, with you all, um, but we are doing what we can given uh, the conditions under which we are all living. Uh, so for today, as, as Maya said in her intro, uh, when she invited me to be a part of this series, it was really interesting to think about uh, that phrase, radical hospitality, um, even though it describes, I think, and encapsulates a lot of how I work and what I think about, it wasn't uh, a term that I had previously applied to my work. Um, and, you know, when I teach my course at, at uh, Ryerson, which I usually teach every fall, I always say to my students that this is why I love theory, you know, theory, a lot of us are like, ah, it's very painful. Um, but, you know, a lot of theory doesn't uh, fall from the sky, right? It comes from lived experience. And I think a lot of what is inaccessible about a lot of the theory that we are asked to read is that it was written, written by people who have very different life experiences to us. And so it's, it's difficult to access, it's difficult to understand, it's difficult to connect to. But when you have the opportunity to read queer theory or critical race theory or black feminist theory, um, theory, a, a phrase, a, a language, a concept, it becomes something that is named that you already know to be true. And that's how I feel about that term, radical hospitality, because as I was doing a little reading and thinking in preparation for today, everything I was reading is like, oh, I already, I already know this to be true. But now that phrase, it kind of concretizes some of these ideas that are more ephemeral or more instinctive, uh, more instinctual, more to kind of taken for granted. So I really appreciate um, uh, the invitation and the opportunity to, to think through uh, and with that term. Um, and so it only made sense to me to do, to think, to, to, to provoke that question around um, host and guest, which is at the base of this idea of hospitality. 
as an artist, when you are invited in by an institution, the institution is the host, you are the guest. The structure that we're experimenting with today is that we are all multiply hosts and guests in this space together as we have our conversation. Um, so I really want to thank Ashley and Mikhail for accepting my invitation to participate uh, in this bit of a different format for all of us and we'll see how it goes. But what we're going to do, um, we've each prepared a very short um, presentation as an introductory to our individual practices. So shortly I'm going to share my screen. I will go first. I will talk very briefly about my practice. Um, and then Mikhail will do the same and then Ashi will do the same and we'll end. Ashi has started us off with three questions. And so we're going to start our conversation uh, by taking up the three questions that Ashley ends her presentation with. Um, and from there, we are just going to shift into taking turns to asking each other questions that try to unpack this, these ideas of collectivity, kinship and, and care, which we all agree are present in our practice and how we work. Um, and I also invite you uh, to use the Q&A as we go and to add your questions as we go. And we're gonna try our best to weave in questions from you as well and not just wait till the end. And because uh, sometimes it gets a bit rushed trying to, to answer, answer everybody's questions at the end. So if you have questions as we go along, I really encourage you to, to use the Q&A function and Maya and I will keep an eye on that. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, I'm gonna close that. Um, so we, yeah, we, 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 we chose these three terms just as a way to sort of uh, form an umbrella for the, the threads we wanted to pull out today. Um, and just to start off, I always use this question in my artist talks, can you feel me now? In all of my work, I'm really interested in questions of uh, particularly black, also queer, but particularly black visuality. So we know we're used to that question, can you see me now? Um, and I put feel in there because the relationship for me between affect and seeing um, is sort of at the core of my practice. I've done a lot of work of, of theorizing um, in the vein of uh, people like Tina Camp, who's an African-American theorist who talks about listening to images and the relationship that we don't just look at images, images produce frequencies, we listen to images. So that relationship between feeling and seeing um, and knowing ultimately, I would say, is at the heart of my practice. Um, and this is just a very kind of brief kind of elevator pitch statement. Um, that I use to describe currently how I think about overall what I do. Um, so given that the black queer body is always already understood to be in mourning due to racial trauma, social exclusion and violence, my work is concerned with the personal and political possibilities afforded by examining black queer longing and loss. And so what I mean by that is as somebody who moves through the world um, uh, with identities, the, the way my body is read, the way my experiences are read is that it must be very abject <laughs> to be me, you know, that as a black person, I face anti-black racism, um, exclusion and violence. And then on top of that, I'm also queer and I face homophobia and gender discrimination. So most of the representations um, of people like me, my communities are around the pains associated with these oppressions that we face. And I'm not trying to minimize those oppressions. We absolutely face those oppressions, but I'm really interested in all of the other pains, all of the other longings, all of the other griefs that we feel that are not part of mainstream representations of black and black queer life. And I say personal and political possibilities because I'm really interested in, um, I think we get a lot of messages that to, to explore emotion, to speak about feeling, uh, my work is autoethnographic. To, to ground yourself in your work is narcissistic um, or is sort of navel gazing. And I really do believe um, in the political possibilities uh, that are created from the collectivity and solidarity um, and portal that can be opened up um, by using your own experiences that are difficult, your own experiences that are painful, your own experiences that are traumatic. Um, as a, a vessel to larger social cultural uh, connections. Um, so I always also use this slide. Uh, and just to say a little bit about my background in the context of today, um, I mentioned it briefly um, in, in my bio, but I would say that part of, part of what really informs 
my thinking and how I work around issues of care and collectivity really have to do with my previous career. So before I became an artist, um, I have an undergraduate degree in psychology and I have a master's degree in social work. And I worked for almost 10 years in health promotion. So I worked at Planned Parenthood doing sexual health promotion. And then I worked at Sherburne Health Center doing LGBT health promotion. And when I decided to go back to school and become an artist for a long time, it seemed like a very radical pivot. Um, but you know, five years into my practice, I've really come to understand that it's, it wasn't as drastic a shift as I, as I you know, initially thought when I lay in bed wondering, should I apply to do an MFA at age 40? Um, but my whole career, I've been working with people with difficult emotions, um, not just for the sake of working with pain, but to move towards healing and repair. Um, and I'm very mindful that I'm not a therapist anymore. That's, you know, there's different ethical lines now that I'm an artist, but there's no question. I cannot deny that the way that I work is very strongly informed by my previous career. And the skills and the knowledge that I gained from the 10 years of work that I did definitely gives me um, uh, the capacity to, to do the type of work I think that I do as an artist. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll say more about that in a bit. And then just formally, um, given questions of, of black visuality and seeing, I think a lot about the, the history of photography, the history of representation um, and, no matter you know what our identities are we've all been fed 150 years of negative representations you know photography is really complicit in the construction of race photography is very complicit in the constructive construction of lots of current negative ideas about blackness are rooted in very early ideas and so as a contemporary artist i have to contend with that history of images and and i think about it almost as a filter that even myself i myself have to look through a filter of every negative image i've ever seen every time i look at an image of a black person and so for me we can't ignore that history we have to contend with it and so these are the to date in my practice these are the formal strategies that i have found um, most most helpful in terms of trying to contend with that visual history as I create new images. So I do think of myself as a documentarian. I work within um, an experimental and conceptual approach to documentary. I use repetition an enormous amount, and I'll talk about that later as well. So that naturally leads to multi-channel work in video installation. I'm very interested in ideas of performance um, and Stillness and soundscape, I would say, I'm, I'm really interested in the two contrasting elements along that. So repetition and soundscape and lots of noise. And then the other side of the spectrum, the opposite for that for me is I also use stillness. Um, and I'll talk more about that too as we get into things. So I just want to briefly touch on this work, Sakti Compositions after Rashad Newsom, um, which is my most recent video installation that I made in 2018. And this is a work um, for those of you who are not familiar with it, it's a 10 minute work and there are 17 black Torontonians in it. It's a very intentionally collective work. This is um, a sort of symphony of, of this sound. It's 17 people making this sound who I shot in a studio and I, I build this rhythm and pattern out of these uh, strips, kiss teeth, suck teeth. Uh, you know, we, we call it different things. But it's intentionally collective because with this work, I was interested in speaking to the anger, the frustration, the irritation, the disgust that Black folks feel living in Canada, given not only the anti-Black racism that we face, but also the ways that our experience are always minimized and defined in relationship to um, America, the United States. And so it's in conversation with a work by Rashad Newsom, who's an African-American artist. And it's intentionally collective because we know when we, if you are a woman and you speak up against sexism, if you're a queer person and you speak up against homophobia, if you speak up, you get punished, right? So if you name the problem, you become the problem. And a lot of times when an individual speaks up, an individual black Canadian speaks up against anti-black racism, it becomes an individual thing. Are you sure that happened? Was it racism? Is it just you? There's a way that it gets individualized. And there are 17 people in this work intentionally to be able to communicate that it's not just me, it's not just her, 
it's not just her, right? That it's like the collectivity of this piece is really key in terms of communicating what I was trying to, to get across here. So I'll stop there for now um, and turn it over to Mikhail. Thank you, Michelle. Um, so for my section, I decided to reflect on the idea of response. And it's an idea that I really, I was trying to engage with Michelle's work and with her slides actually. And I found interesting that in each Ashley, Michelle and I's work, we often question or work with something that happened before. And the work that you just presented, Michelle, with Sakti comp composition, I, I, I found interesting that you were working kind of a, in a response to, yeah, exactly, in a response to uh, Rashad Newsom. Just gonna read quickly. Yeah, uh, I took just an excerpt of um, the description in your website where Sakti composition after Rasha Newsom is thus a, re a response to the frustration of living within this denial and an expression to the anger and pain that many Black people often experience living in Canada, where we are always assumed to be better off, if not completely free of racism. And so if we can go to the next slide, please. So yeah, I in my work, I often use archives and I create a response to the archive that is more really often um, something that we don't question. For example, the, the first work that I did with archive was uh, Peau Noir, Masque Blanc, Black Skin, White Mask, which is a book from Franz Fanon. We, he wrote it in 1952. And I created a work where I was really reading a lot of Fanon and reading this book maybe like 14 times. and. I was trying to see how I could talk about that book and kind of engage a dialogue with this author that I can't have a dialogue with anymore, but to question how I feel about this book now in 2018 at this time and how I feel as me being a black woman. And we know that Fanon has some of his arguments in his book that I don't really agree on where he categorized and he generalized how he perceived black women. Um, if we can go to the next slide. So in Ponor Masque Blanc, uh, in my textile, in my my response to, to um, well, no, in Ponor Masque Blanc and with my textile, I create a relecture, a reinterpretation and an installation, which is kind of my response to this work. And in my response, I ask many questions. I um, reevaluate how Fanon, um, really position himself and how I can position myself with something that has been read so many times before. Um, the next slide again, sorry. And I created a work where I took every lines of the book of Franz Fanon and I coded, so I coded it so I could create a weaving with every chapters of the book. So what we can see right now is basically uh, all the chapters in the book and every lines that was in the in my fabric was a sentence in his book and I basically took um, well the 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 words that we often use to describe uh, a black person or a white person which is always um, black and white and I used uh, black and white treads for the horizontal treads and the treads that are vertical are different shapes of brown and beige and it's it was my way to contrast the fact that we use those words to describe ourselves, and we never really questioned them, but we're, we're not black and we're not white, we're shades of brown and beige. And we, I don't, I don't have an answer to, to, to that, honestly. I don't have an answer to what should we say about ourselves, but I feel that it's funny to still using those words when we know that it's not completely true. And also uh, the, there, there was a difference in the fabrics where the treads, uh, depending on what was saying in the what was said in the book, the thread was either big or really small. And what I found interesting is that he didn't quote, he didn't mention lots of women. And the times that he mentioned women was basically to criticize them. And the little times that he were inclusive in his way of thinking were the small threads. And we can see in the in the in my installation that there were really 
little, there, there was not a big amount of uh, little threads. Yeah, we can go to the, sec the last slide. So my response was to Fanon, to uh, also a unique narrative in Canadian education because Fanon was one of the first book uh, that I've read when I was at university. And it wasn't a book that someone um, suggest to me. It, it was a book that I just found. I don't remember how, honestly, but I always felt like I had to do my own research to be able to have a baggage of my own community, to talk about Black communities. And I felt like it was something that was missing in universities and even, um, well, in high school and everything, it, it always have been something that we know that it's missing. But in universities, to me, it's somewhere that we should we should question those things. We should put up front that there, there were not enough uh, Black artists or even artists from different communities that, we've talk, that we talked about. And it was my way to um, respond on this unique narrative that I have in my education and my education into focusing myself on working on Black others or Black artists. Um, also, uh, binarity of words, uh, mostly in Fanon's work, and I get I get why, because it was in 1952, but it was also my way to create a, a response where I don't engage with binarity, but I engage with questioning how and why is he, um, is he so, um, sorry for my English, is he so um, focusing on the differences between black and white and focusing on the differences between uh, men and women. Yeah. I think that's all for me. Okay. Turn it over to Ashley. Great. Thank you both. Um, okay, so radical hospitality and Afrofuturist art historical scholarship. Um, the next several slides are, are me thinking through kind of how to incorporate um, radical hospitality in my own master's thesis research and other writing. Um, the subject matter of my master's thesis research is um, Afrofuturism and looking at um, specifically Afrofuturist representations of the Middle Passage of transatlantic slavery. So with that subject matter, really trying to foreground ethics and care and how I'm presenting that work. Um, some of the images I'll be showing here, like on this slide and on other slides, um, are not necessarily from that those specific artists that I'm looking at, but they are other works that I've been recently thinking um, both with and about in relation to the Black diaspora and uh, water. So ancestral waters and Black diasporic histories. Um, this, this concept of ancestral waters that I've been thinking with a lot in my research is very much influenced by Dion Brand, um, specifically her text, uh, A Map to the Door of No Return, Notes to Belonging. And so it references both metaphorical and also um, material connections to bodies of water, um, oceans, seas, rivers that the Black diaspora um, has. And that isn't to say that other um, people don't have a similar relationship, but my research kind of is looking at the Black diaspora specifically. So the image here is um, by American, African-American photographer Dawood Bay, untitled number 29, Lake Erie and Sky, from the series Night Coming Tenderly Black. Um, and I love this image because it intentionally, like many of the works in this series, really intentionally kind of emphasize that rich, beautiful darkness of the emulsion. Um, also on this slide is a quote um, from another writer who also really influences a lot of my work, uh, M. Norbisay Philip. Um, so the quote reads, our entrance into the past is through memory, either oral or written and water. Um, next slide, please. Okay. Um, so Afrofuturism towards a reparative imaginary. Uh, Afrofuturism is such a broad term and it really encompasses so many different theoretical frameworks and different forms of um, Black expressivity. Um, when I say uh, towards a reparative imaginary, I guess I just want to be a little bit clear that I'm not speaking about um, material reparations, but I'm speaking more about um, forms of expression that would work towards or perhaps holds the potential towards healing from cultural and historical trauma. Um, through an engagement with Black diasporic histories and particularly through what you could call like an intervention into their representation um, in the archive. 
So here um, I have an image uh, on the left of an artist whose work I've really been interested in and thinking a lot about, um, Pamela Fatsimo Sundstrom. This is her work, Sentinel. Um, she's Botswana born and is based in both Johannesburg and Ottawa. Um, and so I really love this image and I actually really love the pairing of this image with this quote from Dion Brand, which I'll read to you briefly. Um, so one enters a room and history follows. One enters um, a room and history proceeds, or proceeds, pardon me. History is already seated in the chair in the empty room when one arrives. So here I kind of think about um, history being in the room, but history also being very much present in bodies of water, such as the ocean. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Okay, so imagining radical futures, um, I really also wanted to incorporate um, Sundstrom's voice. And here we have a quote um, from the artist, is it, it is my intention that my work operate as a kind of navigational device, a signal that it is still possible for us to imagine and occupy radical new futures. Um, and this is paired with Sundstrom's work, The Incense Burner. Um, what I think is really beautiful and, and so important about this quote is that it's not simply about imagining, but also very much about being in and living in and thriving in Black futures. So that's a, a, a reason why I really wanted to kind of uh, include this specific quotation. Um, and you can see here on, in the image, water seemingly kind of forming her, her dress, which is also kind of um, structures, which seems to be also kind of very much made of water. Um, and so I just think this is a really, um, an artist who does a really beautiful way of acknowledging ancestry and water and also a particular type of Afrofuturism. Um, next slide, please. I think that's the last one. Okay. So in thinking about, um, like the topic and the concept of, of radical hospitality and then thinking about some of my work, I kind of, um, came to these questions, which I, I really love the idea of kind of opening them up and not just kind of leaving them with me, but using them as a way to have a, a discussion or to start our discussion. Um, maybe I'll just read them and we can kind of just take it from there. Um, how, so how does one practice radical hospitality when researching and writing about historical and present day anti-Black racism and violence? Um, next question, how can I incorporate radical hospitality into art historical scholarship? And then finally, in what ways does an Afrofuturist framework uh, enable radical hospitality? Thank you both. Um, I can start that first question. Uh, even though, as I said, I don't specifically focus um, in my work on the impacts of anti-Black racism and violence, obviously all pains are intersected. And so all of my work, you know, those themes are present. Um, and I definitely think a lot about uh, questions of visuality and not just about like the image that I make and what's visible and how that image can be seen, but also what I'm asking people to look at. So when I think about notions of hospitality, notions of care, when it comes to making work that is about our pain, that's what I think a lot about. Um, there's a long, long, you know, tradition of our pain being a spectacle for public consumption, um, our pain being, um, you know, for entertainment. Obviously, the last two years, we've seen numerous uh, writings and thinking about social, what social media has also done to that. You know, the strategy has remained, the strategy is the same, it just manifests differently as different technologies have become available. Um, and so I think about the, the limits that I need to include, given what I'm asking people, not only what I'm asking people to look at, but I would also say more recently, um, uh, what I'm asking people, what I'm inviting people to do in my work. And so, you know, uh, one, one reason I also wanted to share this space with students is I'm only five years out of school. Like I was a student not so long ago, you know? Um, and I think about how the, the institution and the space of the master's degree allows you a certain amount of time uh, to develop your ideas, but that it's a never ending process, right? And so in the five years since I left school, um, as I work through the projects that I've done in those in those last few years, I've come to understand since I left school 
that vulnerability is a big part of my work and I am not a good judge of what other people will be willing to do. I don't know why it is that I'm so comfortable with vulnerability. There's nothing that I've asked people to do that I wouldn't do, but I've quickly realized that what I ask people to do is too much for most people. Um, so when I think about how, as the artist, I'm in that place of host, right? Like how do I create hospitality for my participants? Um, a small thing, I use the word participants. In documentary, we use the word subjects, but I use the word participants, right? Like I, you know, what I name uh, the folks in my work is the first step in the relationship that I'm establishing with them. And so I've begun in the last, I would say year or two to think about opacity and refusal, both in terms of how I construct my work and what I ask my participants to do, and also what I ask my audience to look at um, in terms of thinking about exposing people to, to painful issues, particularly in a gallery space, right? We know that the white cube is not the most welcoming space. Also the white cube tends to be uh, a space of coldness, a space of distance, a space of absence, a space of spareness. Um, and I'm you know, inserting uh, emotion and feeling um, into that. So that's, yeah, those are some of the things that, that, that come to mind for me with that question. Yeah, I guess one of the things that you, you said that I really reflect on was, um, well, actually it's what we ask the public to do, what we ask of the public when they see our work. And I feel like I've never really imagine my work as something radical, but when I, pre well, the, the work that I've presented, it's in a way, it can shift um, between a person to another because in a way, for me, there's nothing radical in that, but maybe in someone else's position from another community or another country or just another position, then it can shift and it can be something different or something radical to them as well in how I present my work and the fact that I coded a book and I questioned this book with this encodage and where the public is invited to understand this code and to understand who is Franz Fanon to be able to understand the, the, whole, the whole work, to, un to understand how this work is questioning someone that written a book in 1952 and someone who is revisiting this book in 2018. So I guess I guess what we give to the public, what we give access to the public and what we engage with, the, how we engage with the public and how we present our work is in a way, I don't know, in a way how we can define radical hospitality. I don't know if that makes sense. Do you understand what I mean? Because to me, when we think about radical hospitality, I tend to make a link with curatorial hospitality. And curatorial hospitality is um, in this definition of what we give access to the public, what we have in a museum, what we have in a gallery, what we have in an artist-run center. And um, is it through um, like the, the cartel or the exhibition text or the guest, the artist, the work? And to me, curatorial hospitality is connected to um, uh, radical hospitality in the, in the sense of what we give access to the public, in the sense of how the public can have access to our work. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, I think when it comes to, to racism and violence, um, there's also for me a question around you know, we've been saying the same thing for 400 years, right? We've been making images, we've been writing books, we've been making plays, right? Like we've been talking about these things forever. Um, and not that we shouldn't keep talking about them, but I also question, and this is something I, you know, I work through my students all the, the time with, because there's a kind of um, Eurocentric notion that uh, more is better, right? More knowledge, more research, more art, like storytelling, that, that that there's just a kind of moral component that, oh, that story must be told, that thing must be shown, 
you know, and I don't know that every story needs to be told. I don't know that everything needs to be shown. I don't know that everything needs to be written about. And that's what I mean about I've been reflecting on what are the limits that I need to think about for myself um, in terms of what I'm trying to communicate, what I'm trying to explore. And that, you know, as an artist, I have a, the tremendous privilege of sharing my ideas, right? Like everybody has ideas, everybody has opinions. And as an artist, you get given these public platforms, these spaces to say, I think you should read this. I think you should look at this. I think you should listen to that, right? So I think that part of that privilege obviously comes with enormous responsibility. And for me, when it comes to issues of racism and violence, part of that responsibility is thinking about what limits are necessary that, uh, that are part of that hospitality, that are part of that care. Where is the refusal? Where is the no around, um, no, I'm not gonna talk about this. No, I'm not gonna show this. Um, you know, those, that's, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think about that also just in terms of um, looking at artists that are kind of taking an Afrofuturist representation of something like the Middle Passage. Um, and I feel like there's, there's a lot of built in tension around, um, you know, how do you balance a certain kind of aesthetic that you might use as an artist in photography or in, in video work with, um, you know, how do you find that balance between um, perhaps like a replication of a type, a type of imagery that has um, potentially harmful effect. Um, but one of the things I'm, I'm a little bit interested in also is looking at how sometimes that looking back can be a way to establish almost like a genealogy of present day circumstances to try to kind of work towards establishing, not necessarily, like I think many black people are very well aware of these histories and how we have experienced these issues and the, the how we've come to experience certain conditions. But I just, I think I am really intrigued about the idea of revisiting the past as a way to actually speak to the present moment in hopefully a way that can actually um, enact some sort of change or some sort of meaningful impact. But um, yeah, I, I do kind of feel this tension within my work about, you know, what, is it, what does it mean to talk about these artists um, reimagining this particular history for sure. And I mean, you know, that that kind of leads into the second question. I think that that gesture in of its in and of itself, right? Like connecting the past to the present is a way of incorporating radical hospitality into your scholarship, you know. Um, and both, you know, in your presentation, Michael, where you kind of zeroed in on this idea of the response, for me, that's also connected to uh, citation, you know, and if, like a feminist framework and a feminist practice of citation is very much to me a gesture of care. Right. Um, and I try to do it. Uh, I, I do it always in my artist talks and I've been thinking about how do I make it more explicit um, in my work as well, because in the academy, uh, it's expected that your ideas are building on the ideas of people who've come before you. Right. And that your academic text very clearly is like this person, you know, theorized this, this person wrote this, and I'm connecting these things in these ways. And here's my new theorization that's building on that, right? That's expected. But then when it comes to art, we have these long standing myths of like genius, right? That like you just had this idea and you made this work and it's just all you. And it's not true, right? Like it's not true at all. Artists are very much influenced and we build our ideas on previous artist works and previous works that we've seen, whether sometimes it's explicit and you know, or you see a thing and you're like, oh, I'm gonna do this with that. Other times it's implicit because you saw a work and it's buried you know, somewhere in your psyche and you don't you know, realize. So I think about, um, I don't, I don't necessarily have formal scholarship, but if I think about this question relationship to, as I build my practice, I do think that uh, citation um, and acknowledgement of sources and influences um, is a gesture of care, right? Is a way to be, uh, to, to, to acknowledge a collectivity. Um, uh, you know, Saidiya Hartman talks about the chorus and I very much feel that as an artist, um, my work is in chorus, right? That it's a continual, both with people who've come before me, people who are working laterally alongside me at the same time, and then the people who, whether I realize it or not, I'm influencing, you know, and, and whose, whose work will be in conversation with, with me. So I see that kind of um, 
lineage and, and building those connections, could, particularly for us, because we know that so much um, Black intellectual uh, production, so much Black cultural production hasn't been archived well, hasn't been historically tracked well. And so when we do that work to write it down, to make those connections, to, uh, to name the folks who did the work, um, that to me is, is that, that even just the response, right? To respond to somebody's work as a gesture of care. Yeah, I completely agree. And also just to add, um, by responding and by acknowledging, I don't know if I can, I can say that word, but anyway, uh, by this acknowledgement uh, of what was before us and what we're creating now, we're creating something in archive that will be in the future, something that we can reference to. And with this archive that we're creating, we're creating this, um, this pont, this liaison, this uh, corpus, as you said before. And I don't know, it's a way to rewrite history from the things that we know that is not necessarily as accessible as we wish it was. Mm. For your last question, I have to say, I don't know much about Afrofuturism. It's not part of how, uh, how I work through my, my ideas. So mm. what, uh, can you talk a little bit more, Ashley, in terms of the connections okay. at this stage? Sure, and I think also, um, yeah, this is a very specific question. So I just want to acknowledge that. And I think, again, it, <clears throat> it kind of initiated with me thinking through radical hospitality in relation to my own work. Um, but I, I think, I mean, Afrofuture's framework granted is such a broad way to kind of describe it. Um, but like with the very generic kind of def working definition of, um, you know, uh, artistic and cultural production that um, envisions perhaps a more emancipatory, liberatory future, often involving technology or, or science fiction or fantasy kind of elements. Um, and there's so many different kind of uh, forms of Afrofuturism, so I'm even like hesitant to give that very generic uh, definition. Um, but I think in a way, um, whether it's Afrofuturism or other, um, if you want to call it like ethnic futurisms or different forms of futurisms, I think that there is something um, in that that could even be more, more than a, a theoretical framework. So for some people, it could be like a way of life that's tied to kind of social justice activism, um, which would incorporate kind of moving beyond like perhaps like academic work and it would really be evolved about, um, you know, like imagining and kind of manifesting like a future that would be more equitable um, and be more thriving um, for black lives. And so I think in a way, I think it's a really, it's a, it doesn't necessarily have to be this kind of utopian um, thing. It can also be like really grounded and just kind of like what are the basic and beyond the basic, but like what are, you know, in terms of having, um, and being able to imagine living in a world where we can all have equitable futures and that would sustain life in a just and compassionate and just simply like humane way. Um, I think that there is something that Afrofuturism kind of holds the potential to do that in the way that many other futurisms I think maybe also do. Um, and because so much of it is responsive, um, which is something that is like, I feel so present in both of your practices, um, it's not even just responsive. And I think this connects to both of your work as well. It, it, it responds and it cites, but it also expands. So I think that, you know, you, both of you in your work, you seem to respond to the work of others, but then kind of take it somewhere else, make it your own and kind of add to that lineage, which I think is a really um, beautiful thing. And I think that in, in some ways Afrofuturism does that as well, kind of responds, but expands. I mean, yeah, the little, I mean, the little that I'm, that I've read or thought about, I, I just, for me, there's the scale of time when it comes to when we think about futurism, that's what's most interesting to me, because, um, you know, the future is five minutes from now, right? But uh, most, most future, it's like way, it's like the scale is like way, way, like way, way, way into the future. Um, but for me, I think it's also relevant to think about what's the future we're talking about or thinking about five minutes from now, five months from now, you know, five years from now, and not just 500 years from now. Okay, I'm just gonna pull us out of this. Okay. Oh, so I'm just gonna pull up the chat so I can keep an eye on that. Um, so yeah, so uh, 
as I said, there are a lot of, lot of different threads that this um, topic pulled out for me. Um, and I just wanted to start by uh, very early on in the course that I teach, um, we have a class that we call, the, the, the week is called Embracing the Burden of Representation. Um, and uh, there's an article that I give my students to read and it's, you know, it's from 1984. It's by Thomas Waugh, who's a longtime Concordia film prof. Um, the article is called Minority Self-Imaging, Oppositional Film Practice and the Question of Image Ethics. Because for me, I really, um, radical hospitality is, is it's ethics, right? And we talk more relationships. And so ethics is, is very much present for me. And I think, as I said before, because of my background in social work and psychology, um, the way I work as an artist is, is very informed by my, my previous professional ethics, right? Which are very, uh, there's different standards and there's different reasons for those standards, but they are present. Like I brought them forward with me when I think about the relationships and how I'm working with people. And, uh, but he, uh, he starts off the article by asking to whom, and this is 1984, so the language is reflections, you know, reflective of the times. Um, but he writes, to whom are lesbian and gay documentary filmmakers accountable? That's how he starts. And the, this notion of accountability in relationship to care um, is really important. And what I find helpful with this article that, uh, because my students are documentary students, but I think it's, it's applicable to anybody. Um, with any documentary course, you're gonna talk about you're accountable, you're accountable to your subjects, and then you're accountable to your audience. But then this article, he's talking about gay and lesbians, but he applies this to other minority you know, groups who would be making documentary. And he adds the categories of constituency and the self. So that as a maker, you're accountable to your subject, you're accountable to your audience, but then you're also accountable to your constituency and you're accountable to yourself. And I'm just interested to hear from you, this idea of a constituency, that word that, that he gives it, um, what in terms of thinking about relationships and issues of care, how, who or what are the constituency that you see yourself accountable to? Um, and in what ways also do you see care in relationship to how you're accountable to yourself? I think it's really helpful that he makes us think about how we're accountable to ourselves as makers. And so I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Sorry, I'm not talking, but it's because this word I'm not even know, I don't even know how to pronounce it. So I, I see that in the chat, someone write it. I just want to see what it is and then understand it more. So he, get, he, uses, he uses the word constituency to speak to, like for me, I think about the fact that, you know, as, a, as an artist, when I'm, I'm never making work alone, right? Mm -hmm. Like I'm making work, my community, Constituency is, is, is another way of thinking about who is the community, who is the group of people that you are accountable to. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's the same with your audience, very often it's not. So for me, um, who is coming into the gallery to see my work? Uh, that audience is a mixture of people. Who I see mm -hmm. as my constituency, who I think I'm ethically accountable to in my choices, who who is the primary relationship of care? Who am I, who, do, who am I prioritizing care for as I'm making my creative decisions about what topic I'm exploring, how I'm exploring it? Um, that's what constituency is. It's who, do, who are the people that you feel you're responsible to, accountable to, that may or may not be the same as the actual people who are coming to see your work. Mm -hmm. no, absolutely. Um... I guess I would say myself first. I guess I would say every every subject, every readings, every artwork that I appreciate and that I create is mostly because it's connected to me. And then after that, who I, well, I have a work that, one of the last work that I did where I used one of the poem of my Angelou and then I continued it. And this poem, I continued it in French and in Creole and so, for me, the public, if they don't understand French or Creole, then I, I didn't translate it. And it, for me, it was a way to be able to connect with 
other communities, but communities that might understand more what I'm saying. And when I say other communities, I was most mostly talking about Haitian communities because in Haitian communities, a lot of people uh, speak, well, understand English, speak French and Creole. And this work was specifically talking about the experience of migrating here in Canada, of coming here in Canada when you, al when you already have a baggage. And I was mostly talking about my dad, but it's not something that everyone can have access to. And even though I know that if my work is presented somewhere, there's a lot of different people that will come, a different public that will come to see the work, then I know that this work that speaks to me, that is really personal to me, will be this personal or maybe more understandable for someone that is from my community. I don't know if that kind of answered it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um, thank you, Mikhail, for that response. Um, I, I think in terms of constituency, I also, I think I just kind of immediately start thinking about art history as a discipline and sometimes these kind of very traditional um, elements of, of that, but in, in terms of what art was looked at, what artists were looked at, but I think regardless if it might be a broader audience in terms of like a reader or if I'm at a public talk and it's a, it's a, a mixed and broad public audience, I, I really do kind of feel like I've always wanted and always felt compelled to do research um, on Black artists and diasporic artists. And I really, um, like, that's really the main audience that I'm kind of writing to. Um, not to say that others aren't welcome to, to read it, but that's really kind of who I have in mind when I'm writing. And especially with some of the subject matter that I'm looking at where I really personally feel like, yeah, there's this moral responsibility to take a lot of precaution with how I'm talking about very painful histories. Um, it's, it's with those readers in mind and those in terms of the readers who might be looking at you know, images that go with the, the work that I'm developing. Um, those are, those are the, the folks that I have in mind foremost. Um, and then it's also interesting too, because I had this moment several months ago where I was thinking, oh, like should have, I should have done work on like a Trinidadian artist. Like I, but then I realized that those Trinidadian voices are like permeating through the research, but just not with visual artists, but with writers and poets and novelists. And um, for me, that was like a real kind of moment where I'm like, oh, I, I can't believe I didn't actually initially make this connection that this this was actually very much like the work of Caribbean um, women writers and thinkers was actually very much informing my art historical work. Um, and then with care in terms of personal care, I think, and or self, like how I consider myself in relation to dealing with researching sometimes obviously it's very difficult to spend a lot of time engaging with these histories and, and the images associated with these histories. Um, I found that when I was doing kind of concentrated research in the summer it was very difficult um, but then I also realized that in order for me to write about artists who were representing um, something such as the middle passage that I had to really educate myself, myself in, a, in a fulsome kind of way um, and that is I think also to try to ensure that when I speak about these artists' work that I can do it in a way that respects the content they are like themselves engaging with. Um, and that, again, that, that's about constituency, but it's also about myself. I think it's just, you know, you have this moment where I personally realize that this is like such a personal research project in so many ways, even though it's about a broader history. And so I think with that comes a sense of um, like beyond, okay, I want to do a, a good job, so to speak, within academia. It's it's so it it is very important for me that I treat this subject matter with um, the the respect and then the care that I think it really deserves. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 been really helpful to me because I I again realized even with some of my earlier work where I thought I was even though I was speaking about a black or a black queer experience. I realized that the primary thing that I was doing was I was trying to convince straight people of something, or mm -hmm. I was trying to convince white people of something, right? Like that, that straight gaze or that white gaze is so internalized that this concept of constituency and thinking about not just who my audience, like whether people see the work or not, because audience is different, right? And community, again, community may or may not be present, but the idea of who am I accountable to? Who am I, who am, where's my care? Because both in terms of when, the, who will this potentially harm? Who will, who will this work potentially impact? 
what story, what am I expressing about whoever that who that that it will impact these people, you know what I mean, if I make certain choices um, that might serve me, that might serve the gallery, that might, you know, do good for my career, but it's going to have consequences for the, the, the that constituency. Um, so that has been really helpful to me in terms of thinking about. Um, and, you know, I think one of the things too, that's really, I think, difficult as, a, as an ongoing thing is realizing and accepting that this idea of hospitality care, there's a power dynamic there, right? So uh, we can, as, to me as an artist, I can't free myself of the fact that I hold, I hold a certain amount of power. You know, when I invite people to be into my work, um, I can set up all kinds of conditions, all kinds of relations of care. I can treat people, you know, you know, I can get people's input. I have all of these different things that I can do that are sort of concrete steps around that. But in the end, I am making a creative choice, right? I am editing, I am constructing this work. And then I am saying, yes, it can show hair. No, it can't show hair, right? Like there is, we can't free ourselves of that, that power dynamic. That's part of authorship, um, creating, hosting. Um, I'm just wondering how you navigate uh, or deal with uh, holding, holding that power as a writer, as a maker. I mean, sometimes there's a concern, I think, about, you know, should I mention something? Um, uh, like, for, like a, a, you know, if there's um, something that happens, like an instance of violence, and but you see like a connection with something that you've already been thinking and writing about, like, should I, in, should I mention that? Or is the inclusion of that somehow um, disrespectful? Or does it, like, so those are sometimes questions that I think about. Um, and I, because I feel like there's a certain power in that, you know, do you bring in this thing to speak to these larger issues that you're engaging with, or by doing so, are, are you kind of, you know, referencing someone's experience in a way that potentially is for your own, not for your own work, but is still very much part of your, maybe your own public writing practice. That's definitely something that I've thought about and I don't have any kind of firm answer on it yet. Mm -hmm. I see that there's a lot of questions. I don't know how to manage all of this, but I've been seeing all of things popping up. So I don't know if we should take one question. Michelle, there's, I think there's one for you. I see one question in the Q&A, so I can take that now. Um, so Kelly writes, given hospitality involves both welcoming and working with invitees, what advice from your social work training would you give to artists engaging in hospitality oriented practices? What do social workers look for to know that they've asked too much of their audience as you were able to identify and adjust to? How can artists equip themselves to work sensitively and responsibly with others? Okay, let me, let me take that a bit of a time. Um, I would say uh, um, from my social work training, I would say social work uh, thinks about um, the individual within systems, right? So when I'm working with participants, I always think that as well, right? So meeting people where they are, thinking about um, even as a Black artist working with Black folks, we know that Black people are not a monolith, right? So if I have 17 participants, everybody's needs, everybody's relationship to Blackness, you know, talking about suck teeth, everybody's relationship to that sound, all of those things were different. Um, I do a lot of what my, my friends, uh, Jasmine Rowe and T.L. Cowan, they're both professors at UFT and they've been theorizing, you know, they've given it this term heavy processing, which is what so many of us do. And again, it's giving us a name. So I do a lot of processing with my participants as well, right? So concrete things I do, I taught myself WordPress so I could build a website. So anytime I'm recruiting people for a project, I build a project website, which gives me a huge amount of space to say who I am, what I'm doing, why I'm doing it, what I'm asking, where it's going to show, how long it's going to take, what days it's going to be. So the social work concept of informed consent, I try to do that as much as I can as an artist. So information is care. I be strongly believe that. So I give people as much information as possible at the project so that they can make an informed decision about whether this project is for them or not. Um, 
once they say yes, they want to be in it, then I do a, then we have a phone call and then I talk all about the project and all about my motivations. Because again, it's me trying to acknowledge my power and trying to have them understand um, what, why, where their power lies and where my power lies and what, what decisions I'll be making, what decisions they're free to make. I have to be very transparent about all of that. Um, and I would say in terms of what do social workers look for that they've asked too much of their audience, I've just learned from the fact that, uh, like I had a project I wanted to do, I did everything I just said, I built a project website, I put it out into the world and nobody wanted to do it. Like that was very clear concrete feedback that the way I had structured that project and what I was asking people to do was asking for too much vulnerability. Um, and so, but the other thing that working publicly allows me to do is I got a lot of feedback about the idea of the project. So people really love the concept of the project but no, people were like, mm, I can't do that. I was asking people to have a conversation with their fathers and I was gonna take their, their portrait at the end. So I just will continue to talk about that project as an example. So it's called The Shortest Distance Between Two People. Um, I, had a con I had a father son conversation with my own dad where I was interested in the transmission of masculinity from him to me. So we have a lot of father son narratives in our culture and I was interested in thinking through as somebody who wanted to be a boy when they were a kid, as somebody who wanted to be a son to my dad, there's a longing and a yearning that I've had there my whole life in terms of how our masculinities um, are related to each other. Um, and I was interested to talk to him about that. So we had this conversation and then I took our portrait as soon as the conversation was finished. And so I, it was such a powerful transformative conversation for us. I wanted to offer other women that experience. So I invited other queer black masculine women to have that conversation with their fathers and I would take their portraits at the end. But nobody wanted to do it, it was too difficult. But everybody said, ooh, can't wait to see that project when it's done. So clearly there was an interest in something that people were like, okay, I've never seen that discussed, I've never seen that represented, I wanna see it, I don't wanna do it, but I wanna see it. So mm -hmm. that feedback was helpful for me to know, okay, there's something here but the way that I have conceptualized it is not viable because I'm asking too much of my participants. So I had to think through how do I realize this project that allows for opacity, that allows for refusal. So the way the project has morphed over the last couple of years as I've worked through everything is I had three other women agree to have the conversation with their dad and record it and allow me alone to listen to the conversation. I'm writing a script that's drawn from all four conversations. And now it's gonna be a two channel video installation where I'm gonna hire an actor to play the dad and I'm gonna play the daughter. So we will have this singular yet collective conversation that allows people to share their stories while remaining anonymous, while remaining private. So it was a way to get to what I wanted to get to, but uh, uh, asking, asking for less, um, exposure of vulnerability for my participants. There is still tremendous vulnerability in them allowing me to listen to the conversation. But obviously mm -hmm. when you see the work in the gallery next year, you won't know who said what, um, and you won't even know who those other three people are because I'm not gonna necessarily include their names in. So they can, they can tell people they're in it or they can choose to you know, disclose that information on their own terms. Um, and just that last piece, how can artists equip themselves to work sensitively and responsibly with others? I say to my students all the time, um, research about whatever you wanna take up is important. And the closer, we all have work to do, even as a black person, even as a black, even with this project, as a black queer masculine person working with other black queer masculine people, I still have to do a lot of work. I still have to do a lot of research, a lot of thinking, a lot of relationship building and conversation with those three other women. So, you know, the, there's, there's, there's space, there's a gap between me and these folks. But if I want to go to Vietnam and talk to, you know, queer folks over there, there's more space between me and those folks. So there's more work for me to do, right? right? So I, I invite you to think about what is the space and distance between you and the group that you want. And the farther that distance is, the more work it takes, right? The more research, the conversations, the, the heavy processing, um, understanding also in the end what your positionality is. I am not an artist that believes only black people should tell black stories or only women should tell women's stories. But what I do believe in is understanding the limits of what story you can tell based on your positionality 
and being transparent and upfront about your positionality. So we know we've dealt with decades of being told, this is an objective look at this experience. And it's not, it's never an objective look. It's mm -hmm. always a subjective look. And I think we need to own that and be transparent about that um, as artists. I actually uh, have a question for you uh, with what you just said, because uh, I really love that project. And um, I'm wondering, the three person who shared their story with you, uh, are they in the process? Are they still in the process with you? Are they still, well, they have access to what you did and can they comment or add some suggestions or anything or how do you, is there a this conversation? Is I mean, this is what I mean about owning the power. No, I said, you know, I would like to have access to these conversations mm -hmm. to inform the story that I'm gonna write. Um, I, they, what the control I did give them is if there was any part of the conversation that they didn't want me to listen to or mm -hmm. that they wanted to edit out. So some people had the technical capacity to edit their own file and send me, other people didn't. And I said, just give me that, I will respect it. Just give, say, don't listen between 17 minutes and 30, you know what I mean? Like just give me the time code and I promise mm -hmm. and I did. And I just immediately deleted those sections. Um, yeah. And just, just, to, just to further conceptually, the way this, this project is unfolding as well, since you asked, is when I listened to all of the conversations, at first I hit another creative block because even though I gave people an interview guide, the same questions I asked my dad, I gave mm -hmm. them to help them. Um, in the end, those three women had the conversation they needed to have with their dad. It mm -hmm. wasn't necessarily a conversation I wanted them to have, which speaks to this concept of radical hospitality too, which really, I mean, the way Derrida writes about it is that, you know, as a host, you set the terms. You come to my house at this time, you eat this food, you leave at this time. Whereas radical hospitality is open to the fact that somebody might come and say, actually, no, I don't want to eat this food. Let's order pizza instead. And that you as the host have to be open to the guest's input, right? And that you would adapt on the fly. Um, and that's kind of how Uh, working through this project really has been because when these women were like, don't listen to this part, I was like, okay, I'm not going to listen to that part. Even though that might be really good for me <laughs> in my project, I'm not going to listen to it. And then when they didn't talk about what I asked them to talk about, <laughs> I was like that, but that's what they needed. Yeah. They used that opportunity to, to talk about the other thing that maybe they really, for the last five, 10 years, they needed to talk to their dad about. So I didn't ask them to repeat it. I'm not mad about that. I, as an artist, have to work with those. Um, if that's what I'm giving to you, then I have to work with what I get back, right? And because I work in an experimental way, um, I, in the end, I don't storyboard my projects. You know, I have a general, even with cinematography, like with Suck Teeth, we just shot a bunch of stuff. It's not the most efficient way of working, but I wanted people to like make whatever sound felt natural to them. And then I will figure out how to make How to, how to edit from that. And so with this work, the extra step that I've now taken um, because of my interest in performance, because of my interest in, uh, I love hybrid documentary fiction work. And it took me, it was interesting to realize it took me a long time to allow myself to take that step. Even though I love it as a viewer, um, it was, I don't know why I didn't arrive there sooner. But basically as I listened to these three conversations, Um, there's points in their conversation where I am like, oh, I wish he had asked her this, or I mm -hmm. wish she had said that. So I'm using those points of my own longing as an mm -hmm. artist to add to the script. So the script mm -hmm. is going to be a hybrid drawn from the actual conversations. And then almost, I mean, I can't quite say I'm doing what Sadia Hartman does, but this kind of speculative fabulation in that mm -hmm. vein, I'm following my own longings and yearnings of where I wish the conversation had gone. And I'm going to take the conversation. That's my creative license. I'm going to take the conversation there, if that makes sense. Hmm. Okay. Uh, I'm good. Okay, for Mikhail, here's a question. I'm interested to know if you thought of different ways to respond and insert yourself in the Fanon text oh. other than the woven pattern. Given that the encoding of voice becomes so abstract, is obfuscation a strategy for you? Hmm. Again, I think being a Francophone is not oh, good for yeah. me right now because 
obfuscation. I don't know what that means. Ways to respond to concern. So, well, maybe I can respond to the first part of the question. Um, no, I didn't really thought about other ways to respond to Fano's work. I actually, well, I did two works with this book. Um, the first one was, well, the, the one that I showed you with the code and weaving all the book. And the second one was um, about the, the woman that he criticized in his chapter number two. And in this chapter, he was criticizing Mayotte Capesia, which is a uh, Martiniquez woman. And she was one of the first uh, Martiniquez women to, to write a book. And he cr criticized her saying that she was um, he, he invented a, a pathology uh, at her, on her name, which is called um, lactification pathology. It's a pathology that he invented to say that she had a problem with the color of her skin. But I felt like he was being intense in his words since in all his book, he's criticizing um, black women. But in this chapter particularly, he's being intense saying that um, Mayotte Capesia is alienated, that Mayotte Capesia is um, almost like a disgrace of her community. And I wanted to know more about this woman. And so I started to do some research on her. And then I respond to the book that uh, Fanon was criticizing uh, that Mayotte Capesia wrote. And I inserted my hair in the weaving. And it was my way to respond in another way, create another code, and to be able to really put myself in my work even though my i'm present in my work all the time but having my own hair in the work was a, a way to maybe connect with her and connect with the fact that i didn't want another woman to be silent even though i didn't understand fully what she was saying i was kind of agreeing with some points with fun and some points with final but to me there is no way in the world i will ever silence a black woman so I just wanted to acknowledge that she did something. She, she needed something to be, uh, to be heard, to be read. And so that was my way to, to respond in another kind of way, yeah. And the second part, I still don't understand, to be honest, given that the encoding of voice becomes so abstract, is obfuscating a strategy for you? So obfuscation means to sort of uh, disrupt, obscure, sort of distract, a more abstract strategy, yeah. Okay. Assombrissement en français. Assombrissement. That's from Maya in the chat, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Pardon my terrible yeah. pronunciation. Okay. Um, Maybe we can know. come back to there's a question here about archives and maybe we just have a few minutes left. So I'll just get Ashley maybe to weigh in on this question um, and then we can come back to that. Mm -hmm. Given the different ways that archives are meaningful to each of you, do any of you also struggle with the pitfalls of archives when, where they intersect with institutions or publics, especially regarding the erasures of BIPOC and queer lives? Do you see your work as contributing to future archives or perhaps come to archives? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think that, um, that some of the artists that I'm looking at are definitely responding to a lack of a presence, lack of a recording in kind of archives, colonial archives, um, just in terms of going back to that, that kind of driving issue of, of the fact that a lot of the black people who were being, they weren't, they weren't being written about, or if they were being written about, it was in a way that was not with regard to their humanity, but with regard to other things such as insurance or commercial business related things. Um, and so I think a lot of these artists are actually intentionally trying to, in the same way that Hartman, that critical fabulation kind of maybe drawing on like remnants that might be there and trying to build something out of that, um, I think that's where you can do something that's a bit uh, um, as an alternative archive almost in the same way that, I mean, earlier I included that brief quotation from Philip Thong as a way to kind of uh, engage with the archive in as far as you can, given that it's not really a, a real comprehensive archive. Um, and I mean, even just thinking actually about 
you know, Mikhail, you, you know, you're weaving as a kind of a, a translation of sound and of, of words. Um, that's a really interesting kind of counter measure almost in a way to require, it's almost, I almost think of translation, like not necessarily even encoding, but a different way to translate what's maybe being expressed. Um, and so, yeah, I think that, I think that that's certainly present in a lot of the work that I'm looking at, engaging with, with what is problematic. I and mean, there's so many things that's problematic um, about the, kind of the, the colonial archive for sure. I hope I answered all the elements of that question. Yeah, well, I don't know if Mikhail was going to speak. I would just say for me that um, I'm, I'm uh, think a lot about Anne Spetkovich's work around the idea of archiving feelings. Um, and I think I definitely align my practice with that strategy. So we know that traditionally the archive, um, not only does it erase us, but it focuses on uh, sort of what happened, when it happened, where it happened. And I'm really interested in archiving how it felt <laughs> when it happened, if that makes sense. Um, so, you know, queer feelings from 50 years ago, queer feelings from 100 years ago, are really different to queer feelings now, you know? And so um, that is part of what I think about archiving in my work um, is the, the internal uh, emotional lives of black queer folks um, in late stage capitalism and climate change, you know, um, through the, the legal social changes that have happened, particularly on queer issues. Um, you know, I think about, I'm not interested in necessarily making pandemic related work, but there's no question. I mean, there's been, this has been a tremendous grief experience and grief is at the center of my practice. So there's no question that, you know, the, 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 all of the emotions and feelings that have um, been present collectively over the last six, seven months will, will make their way into my practice as well. Any, did you yeah. have anything you, wanted, anything you wanted to add to that, Mikhail? Um, well, I felt like I already kind of talked about archives in my pre presentation and talking about how, um, well, engaging with archives is a way for me to be able to point out the things that I had to learn by myself because it wasn't in my education before. And also it was a way for me to be able to respond to archives that I don't necessarily agree with, but I know that is central in my uh, culture and also a way to be able to create something that I know that, well, hope that will be able, that will be able to contribute in someone else's work or someone else's research or someone else's reflections, thoughts. Yeah. So we have a few minutes left. Is there anything that you wanted to share or touch on just in these last few minutes? Just wanna give space for anything that you wanted to yeah, well, actually, I have a really small text, which was um, in my stressed way to be able to understand how I uh, see radicality. And I read it down, so I wanted to to read it. And maybe we can engage furthermore on that eventually. Yeah. So can radicality be defined from one other person to another, from one community to another? or even from one country to another? Does radicality change from one institutional space to another, a gallery space to another, an artist run center to another? Can radicality be perceived differently from the point of view of a historian, a curator, an artist, and finally the public? Is, is it radical to clearly position oneself as a black woman and to make up space in a Canadian institution? Is it radical to question Western academic knowledge when in the very roots of this knowledge and its history, our voices were slash are still erased or silenced. So that was my way to think about radicality because I never felt like radicality was in my work. But if I ask all those questions and I position myself as maybe someone that is working in an instit institution or a gallery or an artist or in sector, there's always a different definition of radicality uh, between all of these positions, yeah. So given that we have such little time, I'll just also share with folks that part of the way that we uh, structured today was that I would be in conversation with Maya, I mean, sorry, but Ashley and Mikkel today, and that um, as, uh, as a gesture of mutual care and continuing our relationship building, 
that in February or March of next year, we will meet again individually. So I will have studio visits with each of them as they enter the last phase of working on their master's projects. Um, and so what I would suggest, Mikhail, is that the three of us take up your text as part of that next phase of our meetings and conversations. Um, and if there's something that um, we can make available on the website later on or something, we can look at doing that. Um, but just given interest of time, I'm, I'm just gonna suggest that. Okay. That sounds like a really hospitable suggestion. If I can make a bit of a pun there. Thank you, Michelle. And I also would like to send that directive off into the Zoom space with all of the assembled audiences. I think that's a rich discussion point to keep drawing through this idea of radicality, but in relationship to place, locality, um, constituency as the word came up, um, the idea of framing what is the hospitality of any given moment and situation, I think will constantly be in flux, revised, reapproached, readjusted. And that's part of the, the labor of what that can, can be and grow as, as a method. Um, as a method, it's, it's active, it's, in, it's a verb, so to speak. Um, and I, I suppose I have to do that very um, inhospitable thing, and that's to, to close this really rich conversation. It's gone by so so quickly. Michelle, when you said there's just a few minutes left, I thought, oh no, this is really like what I need and what is really touching my heart. So thank you, Michelle and Michael and Ashley for your candid contributions and your generosity in sharing your practice and what you're thinking through. I think um, you know, often when one is invited to speak in front of an audience, there's a pressure or indeed an expectation to you know, deliver like this polished lozenge of this is the thing that I'm giving. Uh, but in fact, the generosity and vulnerability of thinking about process and grappling is so refreshing and so, so welcome. Um, and I can see the chat filling up with similar um, gestures of, of thanks. So, um, I'll do this Zoom gesture, thumbs up, silent clap um, to bring the energy that's coming from the chat into the Zoom space. Um, I would also like to make a few other thanks and, and acknowledgements if you'll bear with me for one, one minute. Um, and that is to thank the MFA studio program and particularly um, Karen Zippinger, um, who helps behind the scenes with a lot of the organization, as well as Joni Chung, who is our communications um, social media witch, which is her chosen title. Um, and I would also like to thank Forspace for their digital hospitality and to um, drop into the chat if you are willing and like engaging with such things, uh, a wee survey that they are doing on how we can help um, support and welcome you in these future spaces. Um, they've asked me to put that into the chat and I'm happy to oblige. Um, I also want to um, thank our, our co-hosts, co-conspirators, um, IR, Ethnocultural Art Histories Research Group at Concordia University. Um, it's a student-driven initiative of which Ashley is currently involved um, that is open to students and faculty invested or interested in exploring, pushing, um, futuring issues of cultural representation and ethnocultural art histories. Um, one of the affiliated faculty members I've seen coming up in the chat, um, Alice, hello out in Zoom. Um, and I also saw Adrian Johnson in the chat at some stage, who was one of the um, initiators of this really active group. And I would like to drop their website into the chat um, just to log it in all of your um, internet spaces of attention uh, because they are doing work in collaboration with, um, with Isaiah, um, the Inter Society of Electronic Arts, and are doing um, a really interesting online digital exhibition that is very related to the conversation we've been having this afternoon um, around it, what's called pre-existing conditions and is thinking about hosting conversations in this um, COVID space and where we can engage with different audiences, different constituencies with ourselves and keep asking questions around um, hospitality, care, kinship, representation. So do navigate to that website if you have a chance. 
And um, final thanks go out to the Zoom space. Uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, this sunny day in, in Chochaga, Montreal, I understand it's been a rainy one where you're Zooming in from Michelle in Toronto, Toronto, but hopefully there will be some sunshine and perhaps birdsong <laughs> in your locale before long. And um, the recording for this talk will be available via the Force Space YouTube channel, um, also on their Facebook. And we will look forward to welcoming you in a couple of weeks time in the 12th of November for our next Sika talk, welcoming Helen, Helen Hannah Kloss. Um, so thank you again and have wonderful rest of the day. And um, we'll keep thinking about radical hospitality in our various constituencies. So until next time. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.